Welcome to episode 154 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Darren Lynn Bossman. He's known for writing and directing a few of the Saw movies, and he just did a new film called Abattoir. We talk about how he broke into the business and was able to get his big break writing and directing Saw 2, and then we also discuss his latest film, so stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review on iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 154. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in an email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to, how to find agents and managers and producers who are looking for material. really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Again, just go to sell on your screenplay.com slash guide to get your copy. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer, director, Darren Lynn Bossman. Here is the interview. Welcome, Darren, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you for having me. So to start out, maybe you could just give us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Um, I grew up in Kansas City. Uh, I lived on the Kansas side, one mile from the Missouri border. Um, I had a very normal childhood, I guess. Uh, I got involved in theater very early on in life. Um, originally, that was what I was going to do. I majored in acting in theater. Um, and then there was like a moment when I was in high school, I was in a theatrical production of Jesus Christ Superstar, that uh, I looked around and I realized that my love for what I was doing was not fulfilling me to the point that I needed it to. I loved creating characters, but I thought it would have been cooler is to create worlds. And so I kind of needed more. So I, I stopped the idea of wanting to be an actor at that point and said, I want to be a director. I want to make and write things and control the universe, not just this one person I'm portraying on stage. And that kind of uh, shifted my career. I went to KU, Kansas University, for a couple of years before dropping out and going to film school in Orlando, Florida, at a place called Full Sail University. Okay, okay. And so what did you do at Full Sail? Was it a directing major? Was it a producing major? It was directing. Um, at that point, I wanted to be a writer. Um, I, I always knew I wanted to direct, but it was just easier for me to write uh, my own stuff. So I went there and I, I wrote a bunch of films that I ended up making outside of the film school. So while I was going to film school every weekend, I was out shooting my own short films and writing scripts to try to get uh, noticed. Um, but yeah, I was there as a director, and I actually directed, um, there's, there's two big projects when you're at Full Sail that you could direct, and I directed both of them. Um, and then I got the bug for directing, and I was like, that's it, I gotta move to Hollywood. I, at that point, I didn't expect moving to Hollywood, I just knew I liked film. And then uh, I finished Full Sail in like, I think October, and I was in LA by November. Um, and I haven't left since. Okay. And what did you actually show up in L.A. with? Did you have a pile of three or four scripts that you thought uh, were pretty good? No, I had a bunch of really bad short films that I thought were great at the time that were absolutely terrible. But uh, I thought they were great. Um, I was lucky, actually. Um, I have a, a really kind of unique, crazy story in Hollywood. And uh, you can find it on my blog called What They Don't Teach You in Film School. That, that Darren Lynn Bowsman the blog, but there's a series of blogs I wrote called What They Don't Teach You in Film School. And it literally kind of follows my journey from leaving film school to my first job. But um, one, of the, one of the kind of little side stories in that was, this was in the day of AOL. Uh, now, I don't, most people don't have that anymore, but that was when you had to dial up to a modem and you heard that screeching sound. But they had Instant Messenger, and they allowed you you to search instant messenger by keywords and so I searched the keywords for producer when I was in Florida 
and I started chatting with this guy. Uh, this sounds like a horror story, but I promise it's not. Uh, I started chatting with this guy, and uh, I said, hey, I see you're a producer. I'm a director, and I'm coming to Hollywood. And I didn't, all his name was, I believe at the time on Instant Messenger, was Mr. Bring. That's all it was. And uh, we chatted for about two weeks. And he goes, well, when, you, when, you, when you're on your way to Hollywood, here's my number. Call me. I'll see what I can do. And so I called him on my way to Hollywood and ended up that Mr. Bring was someone by the name of Harry Bring, who was one of the producers on X-Files. And day two of me being in Hollywood, I was working on X-Files as a PA. Um, so uh, I was a PA on X-Files for a few months. It was the last season they were shooting. Um, I was fired. But I worked on X Files for a few months, um, and that kind of—it's—it's it's, it's like a an, an avalanche. One job leads to another job, which leads to another job, and so I was able to get to Hollywood very quickly and get my foot in the door very quickly. Okay. Now, on the weekends and nights, were you writing screenplays? Starting to write feature film screenplays? Were you well, going directing little shorts? Well, that is that is where the, why I got fired from X Files. So, um, I was always writing and. Uh, I got really disillusioned after coming to Hollywood in the first few years of being out here that I was not being offered to direct things. Um, I worked numerous jobs um, where my job was a script reader, um, and I was a, not getting paid. I was an intern, and they would just get like every morning I'd walk in the office and there'd be seven or eight scripts there, and they'd say read these scripts and write coverage. And my job was was basically to say no. And the, if I said yes, I was putting my my internship on a line. If I said yes, read this, that means I think it's good enough that my boss should read it. And I was at a place at the time called Tapestry Films. Um, and they were known for making like the Mary-Kate Olsen, like cute kid movies. Um, but I was there at the time and I read a script and they were making called Van Wilder, which was the first real project that I worked on as a film. But I didn't like that I was reading other people's things that I thought weren't very good. And I was like, I can do better than this. And I also realized that the people that were reading the scripts were not the high up execs. They were people like me that were bitter, angry, 21-year-old people. And so what I did was I started writing my own movie, um, trying to basically circumvent the process, knowing that I knew what I would do to, to, to consider a script and give it to someone else. So I tried to use all those tricks, and I wrote a script called The Desperate, and it was about me. It was about my desperation. Um, and that's, I wrote that while I was working on all my projects, while I was working on X-Files and Van Wilder. And the first AD came over to me and would like, see me working on a script, and I would get fired. They'd be like, this is, you're, you're hired to be a PA, you're not hired to be a screen. And, I, and literally, this is not an exaggeration. People think I'm lying, I'm not. In Van Wilder, I was actually called over by the first AD and second AD, and they actually said, trust us, you will never work in Hollywood again. Like, you were the worst PA we've ever had, and uh, good luck with your script. And I sold that script about a year later, even less than a year later, which became Saw 2. So the desperate became Saw 2. Um, and so that was the first screenplay that I professionally sold. I, I optioned a couple of screenplays outside of that. Um, but that was the first one that was actually a sale to Lionsgate. Okay. So let's talk about that. So you're, you're going into the office. There's seven scripts. Yeah. So you go in five days a week. You're talking like 30 scripts a week you're looking at. Um, how many did you give the proverbial yes to, you recommend to? Uh, well, not many. Um, because, again, I knew that if I said yes, I was putting myself at risk. And that's the thing that only people realize about Hollywood. People are paid to say no. They're not paid to say yes. They say no because no is job security. No is... Because if you risk something and say yes, and they put money in it, they put millions of dollars into a movie, and it fails, you're, you're losing your job. So my job security was to continue to look and try to find something. Oh, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. So I didn't say yes a lot. But one of my jobs early in my career, and this is all in the first four years I moved out to L.A., I was an agent's assistant um, at a place called an agency, APA. And my boss left APA and started his own company. And I went with him. And he made me a junior agent. And he said, he literally had like 100 scripts. And he goes, you find the next script in there. I, it's on you. And he literally left. And I, I spent the next three or four weeks reading all the scripts. And I found a script, um, a writer by the name of B. Mark Seabrooks. And uh, I read the script. And I was like, holy sh this this is great. I love this thing. He let me take it out. And I actually sold it. And uh, I actually found the person to buy it. And that was my first. It's kind of like a drug. Once you find a script and you believe in something and you go out and try to sell it. And that also was, it also had an adverse effect on me. I was like, I should be writing these. I shouldn't be selling these. I should be writing these things. And so um, 
it led me back down the rabbit hole of, of writing my own stuff. So there was, there was, I was struggling when I first came out here between wanting to be a director, wanting to be a writer, or wanting to be someone in the agency circuit. And so um, I went from being a PA on X-Files to Van Wilder to being a, an assistant in an agency to being a junior agent to, to stopping all that and being a director with the Saw films um, and then a writer. Mm-hmm. So um, you, talk, you were talking about as, as a reader, you started to kind of come up with these things that maybe writers were doing wrong, some tricks and stuff. Um, what specifically, and maybe you can talk specifically about that script you just said you did recommend that you really liked, what were some of the things that you think writers should put in their scripts to get past this first one? Here's the reality, and this is, I wish there was a, and, and I haven't figured it out yet, and I, maybe there isn't a true way to success, and if there was, that people would always copy and emulate it. It's different for every person. My story is different than everyone else's story, and I'll give you a, a, a funny antidote how I actually sold my first screenplay, but... Um, on that one, it was, I like to be entertained when I'm reading, meaning that there's, there's numerous ways you can write a script. And I like to smile when I'm reading a script because I don't like reading. It's an arduous process. It takes me three or four hours to read any script. I can't read them quickly. I have to stop and actually read every line and try to visualize it or I get lost. Um, and so to me, it is making the scripts fun to read for me as a reader. Um, it is knowing the format and knowing, like I would put scripts down after six or seven pages if I were seeing spelling errors and um, the formatting was wrong. And I always got mad at people when they would tell me, they would fix it on my spelling because I'm a horrible speller. And I'd be like, just read the content. But the reality is this, is that I don't like reading in the first place. And if you're not taking your craft seriously enough that you're fucking up the formatting and not putting the right uh, structure in place, why do I care enough? Um, But to me, it's making the scripts fun to read. There's a writer by the name of Alex Litvak. Um, He wrote the Alien vs. Predator movie. He's written Three Musketeers. His scripts literally are fun to read that I would read like as a novel. I would just sit down and read them because they're fun. Like, and I'll give you an example. Um, Is swearing okay in this podcast? Because I have to say a bad word on this. So he he was like, uh, like you'll read a thing and it'll say, like, interior warehouse day. And it'll say... Um, a man. Let's call the man. You know what? Fuck you. You don't get his name. You're not cool enough yet. Wait wait till the next page. Like, he'll say things like that, where he's talking to you as a reader, as, as you're reading it, and it's just like, that's awesome. And, like, he'll be like, before an action sequence, he'll write something like, um, are you sitting down? Grab a cup of coffee, because shit's about to get real. The car, blah, blah. and he'll say things like that. And I found myself wanting to turn to the next page, because it was just an exciting read. What I don't like are scripts that are monotonous and boring and um, minimalistic in that approach. But I said, everyone's different. Some people hate what I like. Some people hate when they write to the reader. I don't. Um, My story about how The Desperate got sold was completely a lie and a fabrication. And it was at that point when I sold The Desperate, I was working at APA, as mentioned, the, the agency. And I realized that there's a, there's a formula to get something sold is it had to have good coverage, an agent had to represent you, is all of this, this thing. Well, I couldn't get, I was in that cash 22 that I couldn't get an agent um, until I'd sold something. I couldn't sell something until I had an agent. And I was an assistant. So what I did is I wrote The Desperate under a fake name. I think it was James Luther. And uh, I wrote fake coverage for it as Darren Bowsman. And so I wrote coverage on my own script and I gave it strongly recommend, strongly recommend. I used that coverage to send to other agencies and have my other friends read the same thing, and they gave it strongly recommend. So I had fake coverage written for a script that that no one had really read, and I made up a fake agency. Your friends didn't read you; they just read the. Coverage. They read my coverage, and then they. So basically, I manipulated my way to have a, a quasi bidding war on a movie no one had read yet, and. Uh, I was just, at that point, again, I was manipulating the system, but it worked for me because the script was actually kind of good. And uh, once it was actually read, people started making offers on it almost immediately. And it's that thing that perception is reality, is that the perception is, oh, there's a hot property. It's this new writer no one's heard of. Oh, we got to get this thing. We have to read this thing. And people were trying to get the script before it was even finished. And so there was, no one was able to get a copy of the script. And so by the time it was finally readable and out there, um there was already heat underneath the script. And it was all manipulated. I I look back on it now and laugh because, I mean, this would never work today. I don't think you could do what I did then right now. But it was funny and it worked for me and that got me in the door to meet with all the people which eventually sold and became Saw 2. Okay. Now, um, 
did you get any? Did, did people come looking for this Luther? Yeah, they. Um, so, so what I did was I made up a, a voicemail. Again, this is. 2002, maybe. Um, I made up a fake voicemail box. I made up a fake agency. And what I would do is, <laughs> I uh, a f another assistant friend of mine who worked at another agency wanted to be a producer, and so she made up. She made a voicemail. Hi, you've reached so and so agency company. We're not in. Please leave your name, message, and blah blah blah. And so on the script cover page, it would lead to that m m that that thing. Um, and so the coverage, it's been so long now, I actually have it in a box somewhere how we did this whole thing, but people were calling and leaving messages, hey, we're trying to get a copy of the film The Desperate, uh, written by James Luther, please call us back, trying to get a copy of the script The Desperate, blah, blah, blah. Once that actually happened, we began to pull back the curtain, and when, when they actually got the script, my name was on it at that point. But we just did that as a bait to get people to actually pay attention to it. Um, and it was actually funny, how it got sold was... Uh, I got a, a financier. At that point, I knew I wanted to direct. And everyone that was interested in the script was interested in buying it outright. But uh, someone came to me and said, we'll give you money to actually make this. We'll give you a million dollars that you can direct it. Um, and the DP who was going to be my cinematographer was a guy by the name of David Armstrong. David Armstrong had just finished a movie called Saw. And so he meets with me. We're meeting at, a, at an office. And he goes, you know what? I know you want to make this for a million dollars. And it was probably even less than a million dollars. He's like, do you mind if I show it to somebody? I'd really like to show this to somebody. And I said, I guess. And he showed it to someone by the name of Mark Berg. Mark Berg was the producer of Saw. And Mark calls me immediately and goes, literally 12 hours later, and goes, um, I understand you're about to sell your, your project and allow yourself to be a director. Don't sell it. You're going to meet with me. You're going to come into Lions Gate. We're meeting tomorrow. And so, again, I'm a PA. I'm like an assistant on an, on an agency desk. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in Lionsgate with a room full of executives saying, we've just read The Desperate. We want to talk to you about making this. And so it, 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 literally, it didn't happen overnight. Everyone says it's an overnight story. I've been working for years up to that point. But, it, but the, 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 the moment was overnight where I went from barely being able to afford my rent to getting on a plane to go do Salt too. Yeah, yeah. Was there any kind of pushback? bringing you on as a director absolutely. like the script? No, oh, absolutely. Did you have a pretty good directing reel that you could no, point to? No, I had a horrible reel. Um, again, it's one of those manipulation stories. I feel horrible telling these stories now, but I can only laugh because it's been like 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so when Lionsgate originally, when, when Twisted Pictures was originally going to do The Desperate, they were going to give me money to make The Desperate, my own movie called The Desperate. Um, Saw had just been to uh, Sundance and done gangbusters at Sundance, and Lionsgate said, this could be a franchise. We need to make another one, and we need to make it immediately. We have to come out next year. And so they were scrambling to try to find a writer to write something very quickly. And my movie dealt with uh, a group of people that were being manipulated and toyed with by a serial killer. They came to me and said, wait a minute, we could take the desperate and make the serial killer jigsaw and do it that way. But my contract stipulated that I was going to be the director of The Desperate or any variation thereof. Well, when it became Saw 2, I was still attached to direct it. So I kind of got in through a weird way to direct Saw 2, but I did have to sit down at Lionsgate, and they asked me if I'd ever directed before. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've directed a lot. And they said, do you have any horror stuff you've directed? I said, yeah, I have a, I have a horror short that's won a, best of a bunch of festivals. And they said, okay, great. We're going to need to see that horror short. I never directed a horror short. So this was on like a Thursday afternoon. And so I rush home and I call my parents. And I was like, I need money. And they're like, what do you need money for? And I was like, I need a couple thousand dollars, please. So my parents scraped together whatever money they had and they sent it to me. And that Friday, Saturday, I shot a 10-minute horror short. We posted it on Sunday and I delivered it to Lionsgate Monday afternoon. And that was called Zombie. And... Uh, that got that got it for me. They saw a zombie and they were like, "Okay, we got it. You got it." And uh, two or three days after showing in the short film, I was given the contract to direct Saw Two. Now on IMDb, you have a couple other Identity Lost and Butterfly Three. Bad years. short films, real bad short films. And that was nothing you could show. Though. No, 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 no. That was like me. Um, I've gotten better with every project that I've done and more confident. Those were things I did when I was in Florida, still in film school, that were just really bad, like experimental short films. That I'm not even sure how they made it on IMDb, but uh, yeah. So let's dig into um, Avatar for a minute. Maybe to start out, you could just give us a quick pitch or log on, just tell us what the film's about. I'll link to the yep. trailer and all that stuff. Avatar is the story of a 
a man named Jebediah Crone who travels the world buying crime scenes. And so anytime there's a tragedy in a, in a place, someone commits suicide in a bathtub, uh, a house fire, uh, a home invasion, he buys the house and rips out the crime scene. And we follow Jebediah Crone and we begin to realize that he is building a house of his own made up entirely of crime scenes. Um, that's kind of the high concept pitch. It's actually a story about a, a girl by the name of Jules Talbin whose sister was brutally murdered and before she can deal with the grief, the room which her sister was murdered in was ripped out of the house. And she begins an investigation to uncover the legend and lore of Jebediah Crone. And she uncovers the fact that he's been doing this for years, collecting crime scenes. And uh, she goes on an investigation to find out why he's doing this. Okay, and so how did you get involved with this project? How did the script get to you? Um, I, it's, it's an original idea that um, myself and a, and a friend of mine, Michael Peterson at the time, came up with that uh, I wanted to do a new take on a haunted house story. And uh, I wanted to make a movie not about the haunted house, but the creation of the haunted house. And so this is kind of like an origin story of how a haunted house came to be. Not about people being murdered inside a haunted house, but an actual creation. Someone was creating a haunted house. Um, and so I had this idea, and we wrote a treatment out, and I went around pitching the treatment. And uh, one of the places I went to was Radical Studios. And I pitched this idea and this treatment about the building and creation of a haunted house, and they bought into it. Okay, okay. And then how did you bring on that writer? Was that somebody you knew? Someone I knew. So I, I've, I think I've sold seven or eight screenplays myself. I'm a writer myself. But um, when I'm directing, I'm so overwhelmed with the responsibilities of being a director. I don't have time. To, I take a long time to write a screenplay. Like I, can, I know some people can crank one out in four or five weeks. It takes me five or six months to write a screenplay. Um, so I knew that I didn't have the time to focus on it. I was shooting another movie at the time. I was shooting a movie called The Barons. And uh, so I needed to find someone to write it for me. And there was a guy by the name of Chris Monfett who was a writer that I knew of. He had sent me a spec script called Down Satan. And it was one of those scripts that I was talking about before that I loved reading it. I, it was just poetic off the page. And... Uh, I always knew that if I had a chance to write something on, if, if there was ever a movie that I had a chance to hire a writer, I wanted to work with him. He has a unique voice. It's very much like a Aaron Sorkin by way of Mamet, by way of Tarantino. It's just the dialogue is weird and verbose, and um, it's it's a unique approach of writing. So I called him up and I said, "Listen, I've got this idea. We made a comic book of it. I sent him the comic books, and I said, would you be interested in helping me adapt this to a to a feature?" And uh, he did it, and it's, uh, maybe eight weeks later, he gave me the script, and it was it was awesome. And how did you meet this guy? A spec screenplay sent me a spec screenplay. Um, when I was making Saw Four or something like that, I was looking for my next movie, and I was getting I was reading a bunch of a bunch of specs from people, and he sent one to me called Down Satan, which was based on a Clive Barker short story, and I just loved his writing. And maybe you can just talk a little bit. I get a lot of emails from people. Hey, how can I contact this director? You know, I have this script yeah. perfect for him. Um, just not so much specific, like, you yeah. like, here's my email address. But yeah. specifically, like, how do scripts kind of filter food? Do they typically go to your agent and filter to well, you, friends? Well, it's different. And this is the crazy. This is the thing with seeing this. There's no one way that, ho that it works in Hollywood. And I've read every book that I can get my hands on on how to make it in Hollywood or how to sell your screenplay in Hollywood. And the reality is this. All of those books are right and completely incorrect because it's different for every single person. So for me, um, a lot of it's personal relationships. Do I know someone who knows someone that, like, I, I get emails a lot and people will, will are, try to ask me to read their screenplays and I won't do it. I, I, I don't like reading to begin with and I don't like reading from someone that I don't know. Um, but with the advent of technology and now Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, anyone can reach out to anyone. And it's funny, I've cast my last few movies off Instagram and Facebook. I'm not even joking you. I will find them on Facebook. I will not go to their agents or managers, and I will just barrage them with messages. And I would say a third of the time they respond to me. The same thing can be said about me and my responses to people. Um, I've A couple times people have contacted me on Facebook, and they... they wow me in some way. Um, it's never by sending me the screenplay. I won't do that. But they will engage me or make me think about something and I'll start talking with them. And then four months later, five months later, I might read the screenplay. Um, agents are yeah, obviously a way that you know it comes to an agency. Um, 
but uh, it, it's it's hard. I mean, you got. I think my advice to filmmakers or screenwriters that want their things written is you've got to be unique in your approach. You can't come to me at a party or when I'm at your film school and hand me your screenplay. It's going to go in the trash. And it's it, numerous reasons. One, I don't have the time to read it. Two, I don't want to accidentally read it and subconsciously steal one of your ideas. Three, I don't want to be working on another movie that's similar to yours and you think you gave me the idea. But find a way to engage me in in make me think because you're in a creative industry you're in an industry of being creative and if you're not creative in your approach to me why do I going to give you any time and I'll, going back to my, my story how I got to where I am right now um, I would do weird things to get noticed uh, examples when I was trying to find my first production jobs I wouldn't just send my resume in I would send my resume in a refrigerator box with a singing telegram I was being creative how to get myself out there I remember that I, on Halloween, I sent my resume to a bunch of music video companies, and I would send them inside uh, jack-o'-lanterns, those plastic jack-o'-lanterns filled with candy bars, and my resume was in a circle in the center of it. So when they got it, they, they're like, oh, what's this? And they'd open it up. The same thing needs to be said about trying to sell yourself. If you're trying to sell yourself in your screenplay, be creative. Give me a reason why I want to read it, why I have to read it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing to do is it's a lot easier for me to click on a short film and watch that than it is to me to devote 90 minutes to hopefully like in your screenplay. But what I have done is people have sent me links to their short films and I'll watch them and I'm like, that's fucking good. What else do you have? I'll read your screenplay. That's happened a couple of times where people have sent me, linked me into movies they've done, like shorts they've done, and I'll watch it and I'll be really impressed with the writing and I'll ask them what else they have. So that's another way that I've been able to do it. And it's very easy not easy, but it's easier now that if you have a short film to go shoot it, shoot it with a director friend of yours, cinematographer friend of yours, to showcase your writing. Um, but it, as it as relates to how is there is there an easy way for someone like me to read your script? I don't know. I mean, you do hear fun stories, though. I hear stories about people that have taken their script and left it at the, like, thrown the script over Steven Spielberg's doors and things like that. I find that doesn't really work a lot. Um, but... It's always the people that are unique in their approach that I spend time with and actually read their stuff. And it's just trying to find that unique way. Do I, can I tell you what that unique way is? No, I can't. Find my example of the singing telegram, like how I got jobs in music video production was, things like that. I think you have to find a unique approach to make it worth my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wonder, sitting here now, 15 years later, do you look back at film school as something, um, especially the way you're kind of down on butterfly dreams and identity loss, do you, you recommend something like film school as a good avenue for people? Do you feel like that did at least give you kind of a, a base? I'm in such a different, again, this is 15-year-old Darren talking. Like, I mean, this is years later. I... Yes and no. I'll tell you what film school did. I went to a, I went to this place called Full Sail, which is great. It, it wasn't what they taught me. That you can learn that on set in a week. What I was taught at film school, I could learn right now in a week. What film school did is it structured my life. It showed me that, like the way that my film school worked was, it went 12 months a year. Never, you never had a break, and it went seven days a week. And so your your class could be at one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and you went in 12-hour blocks. So literally one o'clock a.m. on a Sunday, and you got off at one o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday. And they taught you production hours, and they taught you hands-on what to do. Um, and that was that got me ready to be in LA but what what it really did for me was it gave me a community of friends that I moved out here with that if I did not move out here with them I would not have survived so we all went to film school we all became best friends. We all moved out here together. I'm still best friends with those people. Um, Hunter Vi, who's my editor that I use all the time, him and I were at film school together. Um, he now cuts The Mist by Frank Darabont. He cuts The Walking Dead. He cuts Sons of Anarchy. Uh, he is an amazing editor. Um, these are the people that I went to film school with, that community of people, that those relationships. Because Hollywood's about relationships. I mentioned that earlier. It, it's just about relationships. It's who you know. Um, and I think that they gave me that circle of people of who I know to make me survive in Hollywood for the first few years. So the, I say this about any film school. They, they, what you learn in film school, you could probably learn out here quickly. But the resources I gained from going to that film school, I probably couldn't get out here. If I just moved out here by myself without knowing anything, I'd fail miserably. Yeah. Do you know the release schedule of Avatar? How do people see it? comes out December 9th, this Friday. Um, it is in select theaters it's in L.A., it's in New York, it's in Florida, something like that. Um, but it's on VOD and on demand. Uh, 
And yeah, that's how you can uh, watch it go pre-order on iTunes. Perfect. And um, I'd just like to finish the interview by asking uh, how people can keep up with you, follow along. If you're on Twitter, you can mention your Twitter handle. Facebook. Yeah, so um, uh, my Twitter handle is Darren underscore Bowsman. My Facebook is Darren Lynn Bowsman, at Darren Lynn Bowsman. Um, I have a blog, DarrenLynnBowsman.com. And I and again, I, I sound like a pompous asshole trying to uh, condense... 20 years of my life, but I recommend read um, what they don't teach you in film school, and it kind of dic- it kind of talks about my journey, about getting my first job, and how I was able to sell my first screenplay. Um, and it was called Why They Don't Teach You in Film School because it really is what they didn't teach me in film school. It was what I didn't know, and I wish I would have known leaving film school. Because I think Hollywood is such a big scary place when you first come out here and I guess my interpretation of it was I was going to come out to Hollywood and the gates were going to open to me and I was going to get directing jobs and writing jobs and that's not how it works and so it, the, the, this blog I think there's five of them maybe um, just kind of walk you through a, a very broad outline of how it worked for me and the, the tricks that I did and kind of recommendations I would have for new aspiring filmmakers or writers Perfect, and that sounds like a great recommendation. I will get all that stuff put in the show notes so people can click Perfect. on it. Perfect. Um, Darren, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 350 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, I've been getting 20 I've been getting 10 to 12 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire screenwriters for specific projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots, so it's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for, and these leads are exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members. Again, to sign up, just go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. So on the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing screenwriter and director John Fallon. He just did a film called The Shelter with Michael Parr. He lives up in Canada and has maintained a solid career over the last decade. He has more than a half dozen feature film writing credits. And we talk about how he got started and how he's been able to maintain his career over the last decade. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Darren. I love his story about how he primed the pump by giving his own script a glowing recommendation. I do think uh, you should be a little bit cautious and really think about sort of the entirety of the story. It really wasn't completely about the coverage that he wrote or even the script. The key here, though, is he had been working in the industry for many, many years and building a network of people. So once he had a decent script and then also had this glowing coverage, he had a network of people to send it out to. I've talked about this before on the podcast. By far, the single biggest way that screenwriters have broken into the industry is by working in the industry in some low-level job, working their way up, building a network of people, and then having a halfway decent script when opportunity presented itself. In Darren's case, he did all that sort of laying of the foundation, but then he also went out and created his own break. So that's fantastic. But Keep in mind, he put in a lot of work laying that foundation, getting to know people, understanding how coverage works, understanding how that writing that glowing coverage, how that would work and how best to um, get that out into the industry. So again, it's a, probably a lot more complex than just having somebody write you know, some, some fake coverage for you and then sending it out. I find a lot of people 
put too much emphasis on the results. You know, in this case, Darren got to write and direct Saw 2, and that's fantastic. And yes, he did have to do a little bit of trickery with writing his own coverage and using a pen name on the script, but none of that would have been possible if he hadn't spent a few years kicking around Hollywood and working in the business. So really, really keep that in mind. It's a much more complex um, solution that he's presenting here than just, hey, I'll get my buddy or hey, I'll write up some fake coverage and send it out. There's a lot of groundwork that needed to be done for that to actually work. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.